thank God for saving me today. He's good, amen. And I thank you for his grace and his mercy. And uh, you know, I started doing something at the church here. I had people to move up several rows because everybody congregated at the back and I was just setting up Facebook Live so some folks that were homesick could see. And when I do, I only see one person in the thing. I couldn't see the singers. If Linda, it looks like you and I are the only ones in church today. Uh, we might have to start Facebooking from the back now, amen. But everybody's afraid of the front row. But I appreciate the visitors that we got with us to this morning. And I appreciate that you having a desire to come out and serve and worship uh, the Lord and, and be with us. And, and we welcome you back to be a part of us here at Resurrection Baptist Church. Y'all pray for me. I'm going to sing a song God laid on my heart this morning. And then we're going to get down to the preaching. Something is wrong with America. She once held the Bible as her conscience and guide. But we've allowed those who hold nothing to be sacred, like Sodom of old, to push morals aside. Where are the men? Once stood for right and the women who championed their cause. We must return to the values we left before this country we love is totally she has become. The scripture said, blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord, and America has forgotten the godly foundation upon which she was built. Something is wrong. When our children are asked to attend public schools and in many cases resemble war zones, without even the most basic right of a soldier, the right to pray to the God of heaven. Many times a wild-eyed, drug-addicted, gun-carrying teenager is allowed to stay in school while our Supreme Court decided to expel God from the classroom over 30 years ago. Something is wrong. Television daily bombards the senses of our nation with the idea that wrong is right, that the abnormal is normal, that the abhorrent is acceptable, and that what God calls an abomination is nothing more than an alternate lifestyle. And it's had an effect. 30 years ago, the number one television program in America was the Andy Griffith Show. Look what we have today. Church, something is wrong. When our government can pass out contraceptives to children in school without parental consent, and yet the Gideons can no longer pass out the Word of God on school campuses, something is wrong. When our leaders can tell your children and mine that premarital sex is all right, as long as it's safe, yes, something is wrong. Well, I for one, folks, I'm ready for a change. I'm not raising dogs in my house. I'm raising children created in the image and the likeness of Almighty God. And I'm going to teach them the Bible. If the Bible says it's right, it's right. If the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. The only hope that America has is that godly men and women of character will stand together as one mighty army. And they'll stand up and declare to the immoral, the impure, the obscene and the foul. Your unlimited access to the minds of America are over. The army of God that has been silent for way too long 
Folks, it's time to take America back. of the Supreme Court Justice, Brent Kavanaugh. And I appreciate everybody that prayed for him. We won't get political today, but I will tell you that I appreciate that. And I appreciate now that we have some conservative judges on our Supreme Court. Amen. The scales are starting to tip. And let's continue to remember this nation and our president. Amen. I want you to take your Bibles this morning, if you will. Just for a few moments this morning, I want you to turn, if you will, uh, to Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. I'm going to give you a minute to get your place here, and I'm going to get turned on here. Ephesians chapter number 2 this morning. This is some of the best scripture that was ever put in the minds uh, in the cup between the covers of this the word of God here. Uh, Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 8. The Bible says this, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, that's all I'm going to, I'm only going to touch on those two verses, and we're going to uh, go into a little bit more scripture in just a little bit. But I want to talk to you just a minute this moment, uh, this morning, on this thought. Goodness, gracious, the grace of the Father and of the Son. Goodness, gracious, the grace of the Father and of the Son. In the New Testament, I did a little bit of studying, and the, uh, the word grace appears 156 times. 156 times. You think it's important? Very, very important. And it takes on a special redemptive sense in which God makes available His favor on behalf of sinners who actually do not deserve it. Did you hear what I said this morning? You don't deserve God's grace. I do not deserve God's grace. This country does not deserve God's grace. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, The saints shall persevere in holiness because God perseveres in grace. Listen to that again. The saints shall persevere in holiness because God perseveres in grace. I have to ask this morning, how many of us truly persevere in holiness? Now, I want to get on here into the message. I've got quite a bit to preach, and I'm, and, uh, I've got, I'm on some people's time clocks here. I understand that this morning, and you know how I feel about that. Amen. Uh, your Timex will take the licking and keep on ticking. So if I see you look at it, I'm going to step on it. Amen. And uh, so, But listen, we generally refer to grace as God's unmerited favor. Uh, there's no one here that can or ever will deserve God's grace. It's freely given, the Bible says, to all of those who will receive it. It's freely given. It's a free gift. It costs you absolutely nothing this morning. It costs God everything. But it costs you nothing. So I've often heard the term used, goodness, gracious. Usually used to describe surprise, shock, or awe. Uh, I have to say this just because I'm sure there's some people out Facebook land watching. And I, and I wouldn't be me without doing this. But yesterday around 4 o'clock and I was watching Miss Frida. I happened to just I come from a wedding. I was at a wedding and the wedding ran over and I was getting a little little antsy because I wanted to get home because there was just something happening around 4 o'clock yesterday I wanted to see on TV. And when I got home I, it was right at the end of it and all of a sudden I seen uh, the vote carries 50 to 48 and I said, goodness gracious I was tickled to death. I'll have to be honest with you. 
Not over the man, but over I saw God's favor on the country. Amen. I saw God's favor on Christians yesterday. And so what did that describe? Well, surprise, shock to some people. I mean, I saw shock on TV all night last night. I saw people, I saw our president at a rally, and boy, he was up there, and everybody was cheering and hooping and hollering. It looked like a big party going on, and then they shifted to Washington, and I saw the steps of the Supreme Court, and it looked like there was a funeral going on. Amen. I mean, so it's amazing when you look at one spectrum and you look at another spectrum. But I thought about this last night. I thought about, man, God's grace is good. Goodness gracious, His grace is good. And, you know, I remember in 2016 how, you know, it was a shock. I'm sure plenty of people said, goodness gracious, when I, I remember I was in a movie that night. And I remember Sherry's like, are you not going to watch the movie? And I was sitting here, and I was watching the polls. And it was Hillary was up by this amount and this amount. And I was getting frustrated, and I wasn't even paying attention to the movie or whatever. And, uh, but I kept watching. But at the very end, when everybody, you know, everybody had already written off uh, the, uh, Donald Trump and, and everything, and, and all of a sudden, at the end of the night, everybody was in shock and awe. And people were saying, goodness gracious. And I want to tell you something today. God's grace is good. And God's grace is sufficient. And God don't have to pour out His grace anymore on a wicked nation like we are. But He does. And you ought to be thankful. And listen, the sign was not a thing to get a news uh, article or somebody to show up with a camera. That's not the purpose. The sign had been out there. I had somebody say, well, he's just trying to get in the limelight. No, the sign had been out there two weeks. had nothing to do with that. What it had to do with is God laid on my heart that we ought to be praying for some folks, amen. Hey, I had a man to tell me the other day, he said, Brother Tim, he said, listen, he said, you know, the stand don't have to be so extreme. He says, listen, whatever God's going to uh, have take place is going to happen. So we really don't have to do anything. And I said, no, I disagree. God didn't call Christians and pastors and preachers to sit around and say, well, you know, God, I know you know everything. And God's going to do whatever he wants to do. So I don't have to do anything and rely on God. Listen, what we're supposed to do, the Bible tells us, when we get saved, amen, we're supposed to go out here, amen. We're supposed to carry the banner, amen. We're supposed to take a stand for God. And hey, listen, and that's when God will pour His grace out. Don't you sit around. Hey, that'd be like me saying, you know what? I ain't ever going to pray for nobody in this church. I, I don't care if you get saved or not because you know what? God has a plan. God has a plan, so it don't matter if I preach, pray, whatever, because God knows what's going to happen and God will work it out how He wants to. Folks, that makes absolutely no sense. God's grace is sufficient, the Bible said. So listen, divine grace does just that. What does it do? It shocks. It puts us in awe. It makes us wonder how in the world could a God as big as the universe, I mean, He created the universe. He threw the stars in the sky. She just sang about it. He does all these things. He loves us and He provides for us. How could a God like that love somebody as wretched and wicked as we are? Grace. Grace. Unmerited. Undeserved. Nothing I can do to earn it. Matter of fact, if, if we all got what we deserve today, we'd, be, we'd have our backs broken. We'd all be in hell burning today. That's what we deserve. But thank God for grace today. And have you ever heard somebody say this? Well, it's only by the grace of God. I hear that all the time. Only by the grace of God. What a true statement. And that applies to every single aspect of our lives today. Only by grace are we saved through faith. That's what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says. For by grace you're saved through faith. Matter of fact, if you want to just put your eternal security uh, 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 heading right there, you can do that. That right there tells me, folks, listen, when you're saved, you've got it. You know how I know you got it? Because he says you're not saved by works. If, if I was saved by works, I'd have to work to keep it. It says we're saved by grace through our faith. It's only by grace today that everybody in here took another breath. Somebody 41 years old died last week. Somebody 16 died the other day. I seen an 8-year-old Facebook died from a, a form of cancer yesterday. People die of all ages, all races, all political spectrums. That's why we've got to be ready to meet the Lord. But you know what? God's unmerited favor on every single person sitting here from the youngest to the oldest that was able to walk in that church door this morning. That's called grace this morning. And you better thank God for it. If you've got a home this morning, you've got a job that pays your bills, if you've got a family, 
you got health, a church, you got a president, you got a country, you got leaders, you got all these things that work in your behalf. You ought to be thanking God for it today. That's God's grace. That's His unmerited favor. Now, I thought about it yesterday. My wife does not like politics. If there's ever a reason to divorce her husband, it would be politics. <laughs> Listen, folks, I used to not care about politics when I was lost. I could care less. But when God saved me, I got a little bit interested. Because you know what I understand? That the Word of God is a guide for us. You cannot be a Christian and not be concerned about the nation that God has blessed you to live in. So, when I saw yesterday the, the confirmation process, you know what I said? God just confirmed a man to the highest court. Now, there's a lot of people that don't like that, and we can agree to disagree. It's okay. But a lot of people that are running around here, the movements, and a lot of the people that have such disgust and disdain, and people losing their minds. Look at the signs they carry. Look at the, the vulgarity. Look at the, the things that you see. That, there, a, lot of, a lot of these folks have something in common. And I'm not saying everybody, so don't take that out of context, but I'm saying, listen, folks, the Bible says we live in a wicked and perverse generation. People that send me ugly messages, what I like to do, I like to Facebook stalk. I come in here the other day, but they might have got me a pad. And everybody called me. Here's the thing. If I can stand up here and preach it, I can stand right out here in the street and meet you and talk about it. I don't have to blow up my number. I don't have to hide my address. You know where to find me. But do you know that 90% of the people that left me ugly messages, Miss Frida, they blocked their numbers. They blocked their numbers. Why? Are you afraid of... Why? Why? Listen, we live in a nation. We ought to be able to be able to disagree with our brothers and sisters. I talked to a lady yesterday at a wedding. And she brought it up. And we were talking. And she, she was 78 years old, the grandmother of the bride. And we got to talking and, and look, something she brought up something and she said, What you know, what church do you pastor and this, this, and this? And you know, well, what's your take on of course it came up. Everybody's talking about it. Well, don't ask me if you don't want to hear, so I told her, and she was very respectful, and she said, God bless you. She said, Thank you. She says, because you know, there's a lot of preachers out here that won't do that. There's a lot of preachers that won't stand when it comes to something like that. You know why? Because they're afraid they're Membership might drop, or they're afraid that their church might not be popular, or they're afraid that they'll get threatened with, well, you're going to start paying taxes. Does our church, listen, for once and for all, everybody in here, there's the treasure. I want to explain something about this church. We are not 501, 401, 3C, any of that, okay? We're none of that here. If we go somewhere, if I go somewhere and I go to Lowe's to buy something for the church, we pay taxes, okay? Now, we are, ta we are a non-profit, which means in the county, we didn't, pay to, we, didn't pay our, we didn't have to pay our tax bill. We're non-profit. But we are not getting kickbacks from the government. We're not taking the government's money like a lot of churches do. The government comes in, you know, and, and because the thing is, I feel like we compromise when we do that. All right? And, and we refused. I had the paperwork to fill out when we first started, and we didn't do that. So let everybody understand that. Second thing is, I'm not worried about it. If, if the government wants to come in and say, well, you know what? You're going to pay property taxes. Well, I promise you if the church won't pay it, I'll get out here and I'll mow yards. I'm pretty good at that. I've got good this year doing it. I'll mow yards and pay the tax bill. I'm not worried about that. The point I'm trying to make is I sat there yesterday. And boy, I tell you, God knew I needed this. And I saw Robert Jeffers come on there. Most of you know him. If you hadn't, he's on TV. 12,000, some of you read it on Facebook. 12,000 member congregation. Largest church in, well, one of the largest churches in Texas. And he's a Fox News contributor. And they asked him. And he sat there and he said, Christians, go to the polls. Well, Christians, it's important. This is decision. This ain't about politics. This is about our kids. It's about our religious liberty. It's about a country that we're watching turn into Sodom and Gomorrah. And we're sitting back and we're afraid that somebody's going to pull our tax status. Folks, wake up and look around you. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And we are the majority, and it's time to stand up. Right. 
It's time. It's time for the Christians to finally take a stand. You can think what you want to about me. And I appreciate the people saying, I got you back, preacher. Listen, I appreciate that. But I am who I am. And God saved me and God called me. And I feel like I'd be doing a disservice to the ministry if I wasn't the one that would just stand up and say, God, here I am. Use me. Help me to stand. Because sometimes it's not easy. It's not easy sometimes getting fussed at and ridiculed and cursed and this and that. And, and I got preacher friends and God bless them and I love them. But they ain't been nowhere around the Facebook post. Hey, I support that, whatever. You know why? Because there's a lot of people, if they get an inkling that another church is supporting what you're doing, even though they're thinking it, they're worried about losing something. I'm not worried about losing nothing. My home's in heaven. I'm rich on the other side of glory. There's nothing down here holding me here. Hey, listen, I'm just a pilgrim walking through this earth trying to get to my home. Hey, listen, I'm not up here to win your popularity today. We call it grace. America, America, God shed His grace on me. Well, if it's, if it's such good grace and we didn't deserve it, why do we as Christians sit around and we get worried about what somebody thinks about the church? Don't you worry about that. All you've got to do is focus on, on what Jesus did for you on Calvary, winning lost people, loving people even that disagree with you politically or spiritually or whatever. And at the end of the day, be able to pray for your neighbors, your enemies, whatever. Listen, we don't have a whole lot to do. It's pretty basic. But people don't want to stand no more. It is only by God's grace, His divine favor still on us and a nation that so does not deserve anything other than hell today. So here's what I want to preach on just a minute. Just a few minutes here. I've got a couple points. I'm going to let you go here. I want to talk to you just a moment. In my title, I said, Goodness Gracious, the Grace of the Father and the Grace of the Son. I want to give you some Bible illustrations here in just a few minutes on the, the difference of the two. First of all, I want to talk about grace just a minute, the grace of God. People said, only by the grace of God. Let me tell you, number one, about the grace of God. It's freely given. The Bible says it's free. In Psalms 84, 11, the Bible says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. Man, boy, I preach right there. I just start. Hey, I'll put it in park air for the rest of the day. It's a sun and a shield. You know what that shield does? That shield protects me walking in this church. I'm not worried about nobody. I was kidding with somebody. I won't call her name. Amen. Thank goodness she went and got her uh, concealed thing the other day. She's a little bit worried about the, about the Wild West cutting loose in the church. I ain't even going to look that way because I know I'll start laughing. And I'm just giving her a hard time. Listen, I'm not worried about nobody walking in that door. The Bible tells me, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. He'll protect us. He'll take care of us. Listen, folks. The second part of that verse says, the Lord will give grace and glory. Grace and glory. He's the sun. He's the shield. And he provides grace and glory. I believe a church that will stand on the word of God that will not compromise no matter what. No matter what people say. I, 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 how many people in here tweet? And I'm not talking about wives when you get in your husband's ear. Anybody else in here? Do you tweet? Do you tweet? Anybody else raise your hand? Twi Twitter? I know you Twitter. You's all over it. <laughs> For, uh, they didn't even get the news interview on the thing, and David Wisnett tweeted out something, and boy, Twitter was just, I was getting hammered on Twitter. I don't even watch Twitter. And I have to go on there and actually sit, she's like, did you see this? And she was getting all worked up about it. I'm like, don't worry about it. Pray for them. But I happened to look on there, and I saw a tweet on there. And it was a lady. She never stepped foot in this church. Now, she must be local. She must know somebody. Know somebody. And she tweeted on there, the FBI needs to investigate that preacher. Now, first of all, <laughs> first of all, my son said, pray for Judge Kavanaugh. Oh, we need to get the FBI out there. So here they go. Now the preacher's getting accusations. I need to be investigated. I need to be investigated. Why? Here's why. Now, she's supposed to be a Christian. But she's citing, she's not even talking about the point of what the, the, the prayer or anything about the politics. That preacher needs to be investigated. Because I heard that he run off several people from his church and he scared them to death. <laughs> Folks, I can't tell you where, where this will lead to next week. Next week it will be I murdered five people and buried them in the, in the graveyard back here. 
It never ceases to amaze me, but that's what you got to do. All you got to do is just sit there behind a the keyboard, blocking your number, whatever, and you put something out there. I went to the lady's Facebook as soon as I saw it. Of course, I couldn't get on there because I was going to just send her and say, you know, hey. So I tweeted back. Did you see my tweet? I tweeted back. I did a tweet. <laughs> I tweeted back and I said, now, now, let's be very mindful to tell the truth on here. That's all I said. Now, the point I'm trying to make is, is this. Folks, God's going to protect us. I can't control what you, what somebody says about me. You can't control anything somebody says about you. You can't shut somebody's mouth up. You can't. Listen, just don't worry about it. Keep your mind focused on the things of God. Don't worry about everybody else. It's okay. People are going to say stuff. I disagree with half the stuff I seen on the news last night. But I didn't hop a plane even though Linda said she'd go with me and go to Washington. The thing is, folks, listen. God has shed his grace not only on us individually, but this country. Aren't you glad you live in the United States of America? I mean, you could have woke up today in an underground church somewhere over in North Korea that if they caught you reading the Bible, they'd put you in jail or beat you or kill you. I mean, be thankful where you live today. This is America. We're still the home of the, the land of the free and the home of the brave so far. You could, you could have been born in any other country. I'm thankful to be an American. I love the country. I believe there's still some good here. Amen. I do. But I think God's grace eventually is going to run out. David got a taste of God's grace right here. Let me finish the rest of that verse. It says, For the Lord God is the Son and His shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. You know what the problem is? Let me tell you what the problem is. Hey, matter of fact, maybe I need to send this to the NFL. Hey, He says, I'll give my grace and glory to them that walk uprightly. Here's the problem. Half the country's on their knee, amen. And they're not on their knee for the Lord. They're on their knee protesting everything that the country stands for. He says, I'll bless them to stand uprightly. Amen. We need some people in this country. We need people in our churches that will walk uprightly. Hey, that will put sin in your rearview mirror. I love the people. I tell you, I, I, it motivates me sometimes. The people that remind me of what I used to do. Well, I remember seeing you at the bar, and I remember seeing you do this and that. Hey, guilty, that was me. I remember you with the women and the booze and this. Hey, that was me. Hey, I'm not denying it, but I thank God for His grace. Because if it hadn't been for His grace, I wouldn't be here today. That's God's grace. That's right. Amen. Now, you want to go out here and hire a perfect pastor? Good luck finding one. But I'm going to tell you something. I kind of like the pastors that have been through the ringer. I like the pastors that have been in the world. I like the pastors that can stand up here and tell you, don't do what I did. Hey, and, and stay close to the cross and don't walk away from God because I wasted a lot of years. God's grace. David said, listen, he's telling us. He says, listen, there's a formula in this verse here. He says, just live what you say you have. If you're saved today, live it. If you're saved and you know it, clap your hands. If you're saved and you know it, why don't you just stand up and live like it, amen? Quit living like hell all week. Quit confusing everybody around you. There's people not in church today. I, 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 I disagree with a preacher around here on a lot of things, but I'll agree uh, with one thing that he said. And I love him to death, and we just agree to disagree on some things. But I agree with this. He said that we've got too many preachers and pastors standing up in the pulpit preaching and spending all their time on church members that are lazy that lay out of church and we're preaching less to the, to the people that need Jesus. I believe that. I spend 90% of my time chasing people that have gotten out of church all the time. Please come to church. Go, oh, we miss you. Please get your kids in church. You don't understand what you're doing and all of this. And you know what they do? They ignore you. But they'll send you a message. Hey, Pastor Appreciation, I'll get a message saying, hey, you want, you want some chicken or you want some, uh, you want to make some muffins? But they won't answer anything else you send them when it relates to church. You know why? It's like I'm invisible. Preacher, you know, I, I, I'm not going to go to church this week or next week or the next week. But then all of a sudden, if they got something good, I'll show up for it. Folks, listen to me today. It's so important, and I see it all the time. God's grace eventually, He's not going to spoon feed you a big dose of grace anymore. When your lives are falling apart, your family's falling apart, and your, your daughter's pregnant, and your son's on drugs, and this and that, and you say, Preacher, I don't understand why. Just look back. Look at all the grace that He's bestowed upon you. And where are you at? Where are people at today? 
There's people that could have been in church today. It breaks my heart. I know you get tired of hearing about it. And I've heard bad people tell me, preacher, move on from them. And then when I move on from them, I get backlash because I didn't love them enough. So it's like you can't win. It's not rocket science. It's God's will that we live as a new creature when we become born again, folks. That's the hardest thing for the church in 2018. People say they want to get, oh, preacher, I want to get saved. I want to turn from that wicked life and all that. And they get saved and then all of a sudden they're back out there. You know why? Because they can't get grounded here. They can't get their feet grounded. I've seen people all week long for the last two weeks politically charged. Christians, Miss Frieda, I mean, they've been on their left and right. Just political posts, political posts, political conversations, arguments, this, that, and the other. I have to think to myself, boy, they're so outspoken about that. Why aren't they in church today? God just answered your prayer. God just came. God answered one of the biggest prayers that you'll ever see in your lifetime in regards to this country yesterday. Where are they at? Where are they at? Why ain't they here faking him? Why ain't they here worshiping him? They worship me and they praise me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's what the Bible says. Acts 11, 23, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad, exhorted them all, that with the purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. See, Paul experienced God's grace after being on the road to hell. That day on the road to Damascus, Paul was on the way to hell, Saul at the time, and God saved him and he changed him. And who would have thought that Saul, a tax collector, an evil guy, who would ever thought he would have traded his checkbook for the word of God, amen? But he did. God saved him. He gave up what he was doing. He started living for the Lord. Got a Bible in his hand instead of a, a census or a, a checkbook or a bank statement. Number two, it empowers men for service. This, this is one of my favorite points. 1 Corinthians 3.10, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Paul could have never spoke these words before he met the Lord Jesus Christ. See, when we're born again, the grace that we get a taste of, it ought to motivate us. It ought to give us the push that we need to serve God faithfully. I know I sound like a broken record. For the last years, I've preached faithfulness, 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 faithfulness. You want know to tell you something? I'm as human as you are. I hurt like you. I cry like you. I bleed like you. All of those things. But you know what? Since God saved me, one thing I can say is I've been faithful to Him. And you know what? It ain't been easy. When I look out and I see people out of church, you don't think, I don't think, well, what's the point sometimes? But God's grace, i got a taste of it. And when you get a good taste of God's grace, you don't ever want to go back. If I were an employer this morning, I would expect my employees to be punctual at work, hardworking and dependable. I think any employer expects that. And most people in this church will do that. If I called your boss today, hopefully they'd say, yep, very punctual, very dependable, very faithful, does a good job, hard worker and everything. But let me ask you a question. If we can do that on our jobs for a paycheck, why, can, why can't we do it for God who shed his grace on you? Your employer gives you a paycheck. God gives you life. He gives you breath. He gives you everything that you have and the job that you're able to get a paycheck from. But we won't be faithful. We won't be dependable. Why? Why? shed his grace on you today. If you're sitting here today, everybody in here has experienced grace. Number three, the, the grace of God may be rendered ineffectual. You say, what do you mean? You're just saying all these good things about grace. Now you're telling me it's not effective. James 4, 6 says this, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Get puffed up. Get puffed up. Been there. Know how it is. When I first got into ministry and everything and took my first church, I was accused. I turned down a church. You know why I turned it down? Because God, I, you pray about things. And God was not leading me there. And I turned down this church. And you know what, you know what they went around telling everybody? They said the reason I turned it down was because they couldn't pay me enough. 
Okay, fair enough. That's what you want to believe. Miss Linda, before I ever met you, I went to another church. They called me to come in as a supply pastor. I went in, I preached numerous, numerous times in a very big church. The first church offered me about $50 a week to pastor. A little tiny church. Had nothing to do with the money. Most of you know, I pastored Mercy. I, I never got a check. The second church, Miss Frieda, that asked me to pastor, $65,000 would pay my insurance, would pay my cell phone bill, and give me housing allowance. And I had a big plush office with security cameras of the whole property. Had a big gym, had Starbucks. Seriously, they had Starbucks in there. I'm not saying, it wasn't fake, it was Starbucks. It had a little green thing and everything. A little green gremlin or whatever. I don't even love what that thing is on there. I don't drink it. Donuts, biscuits every morning. You thought you were in Regina's class. They had a spread. <laughs> Guess what? Turned it down. You think they went out and said, the preacher turned it down because we were going to pay him too much money. Folks, in this, in living and serving God, you're always going to be on the chopping block. You're always going to be in the line of fire. But you know what? One thing I learned was humility. I don't do it to be seen. Because there's nothing good about me. I'm amazed every day that God lets me get up in front of people and preach his message. As bad as I was before I got saved. And he still gave me the grace to be able to do it. So, God's grace may be rendered ineffectual. Why? When we puff up. When we have too much pride. See, all things are attributed to God's grace. You don't deserve it, but he allows the floodgates. But then sometimes he also allows the drought based on how we live our life. You ever wonder why somebody seems like they're on top of the world all the time? They're singing Amazing Grace. There's a lady at our work that I work with at the surgery center. She comes in, sweet lady, plays again at another church, sings. Every time I come in, she's, she sh Devon, she's shorter than you are. <laughs> Sweetest lady ever. As soon as I walk in, her name's Shirley. The other day, I, I was coming down the hallway, and I heard, it keeps me singing as I go. That's what I hear. And then I cut another corner. That's amazing grace. Near the cross, this, that. She's always singing. Comes in the room, the doctor's in there. They're in there listening to rock and roll, country, whatever, rap, whatever. She walks in there, boy, she's just singing praises of the Lord. Everybody loves her. Everybody respects her. She's humble. She loves the Lord. I believe that the way we live determines how much grace we get. Number four, it's not given for selfish, self, excuse me, selfish usage. First Peter 4.10, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. See, when God blesses us, we're supposed to be a blessing to somebody else. You ever think about that? He didn't say, I'm going to pour out my blessings upon you. I want you to soak them in like a sponge. And just keep them. We're supposed to be a blessing to somebody else. We're supposed to be a blessing to our neighbor. And listen, not only are we supposed to be good stewards in our tithes. That's why every time we hear the word steward, we always think about tithes. But listen. And that's important. We're supposed to spend God's money in the, the way we should. We, we're not supposed to go out here and throw it around and do stuff that we don't need to do with it and all that. We should take on missions and pay the bills at the church and things like Yes, we, we know and, and, and all that. But listen. But there's other things. He says give to others. Coat closet. Groceries. Maybe we can't give out money, but there's something we can do. Can we build a ramp for somebody? Can I come take you to the hospital or to the doctor? Can we run you by something that you might need? You can't get out. Can I bring you a gallon of milk? Or is there something I can do for you? I've got a few people in this church that will go visit people. A few. Now, I'm not fussing, but I'm telling you this. The reason you don't visit is because you are not on the flip side. You're not the person that can't get to church. You're not the person that is hurting. You're not the person that has to do without. Life is good until it's flipped around. Folks, I don't care who you are. I want to tell you all something. I went to the hospital a couple times, and I visited somebody. And they're so thankful that they got somebody to just stick their face in the room and say, hey, even if you can't stay a long time, it's good to see somebody. You Facebook all you want. You can call on the phone all you want. But sometimes it's just nice to see a smiling face, a brother or sister from church to come in and say, hey, good to see you. 
You know what it lets them know? It lets them know you care. See, Facebooking and stuff, everybody can do that. It doesn't take any time to do that. It's not inconvenient to do that. But it's inconvenient when we have to drive 20 minutes out of the way when we've got to go somewhere else. Or we, got, we want to do this or we want to do that. You know what? Grace is not given for selfish usage. We're supposed to give it away. No ulterior, no ulterior motives, just a sincere helping of grace for somebody else. Number five, grace is given to the humble. First Peter 5.5, 5, I've got about five minutes, I'll close here. Likewise, be younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed, listen to this, with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. You know what that means? Respect one another. Respect others' opinions. Hey, Facebook world, everybody who likes to troll pages, you can be a Democrat, I can be a Republican, I can be a Democrat, never happened, by the way, or you can be a Republican. But here's the thing, we can still love one another. We still can disagree. Just because somebody carries the NIV don't mean I can't stand them and I can't, I can't have nothing to do with them because I'm King James only. Just because you believe you can lose your salvation and I can show you all over the Word of God that that is not biblical, that once you're saved, you're saved. But you know what? We still can love one another. The only difference is you're going to have a miserable life trying to work to keep yours, and I ain't got to. Amen. Now don't give me that way. Well, that don't mean that. So you just can go out here and you got a license to sin. I can hear it already. No, you don't have a license to sin. Here's the thing. When God saves you, do I think people can fall back and sin? Sure they can. But they ain't going to stay there. God's going to get a hold of them. This is for the people that go out here and say they're saved and they live like hell, drink, do drugs, whatever, uh, sleep with this one, that one, whatever, and they just do that their whole life and say, I'm saved and I'm out of the will of God. I don't believe that. I believe they need to get born again. Amen. You know how I know that? Because that used to be me. <laughs> so here's the thing. Respect each other. Respect each other. Even though you don't agree. If somebody comes up to you, if a Jehovah Witness, they come up, respect the fact that at least they, they do believe in something. And they stand. Respect the fact that they stand on what they believe even though it's wrong. Respect it. And have a conversation. Let me tell you something else. And this will go a long way. Respect your pastor. And I'm not just talking about me. If I was in your position, I had never ever went to a church that I did not respect the pastor. You know why? I don't care what you think about it. It's, it's not based on your opinion. See, God didn't phone, as far as I know, God didn't call anybody in this church and say, listen, uh, I'm going to do the confirmation here on Pastor Jones, and I need to know uh, what you think, and we need the FBI, to, you know, I need you to go and do a background check. Listen, that's not what God does. God calls the man of God, okay? He calls him, and you're supposed to respect him. If you disagree with something, and you come to the pastor, and you, you can't get past it, and if you need to move on to another church, that's understandable. But you still can respect one another. You don't have to come in the church and just because a pastor, you know, you get in an argument with somebody. Boy, I've been there before. I mean, I'll tell you something. I want to throw this out. This, let me just tell you all this. I got into a referee, refereeing between two or three ladies in a church over the way and the location of the plates in the fellowship building. <laughs> One of them spent half a day moving them around, and the other one who was in charge of it didn't like the fact that she went over there and took her time and was at least working, trying to help to clean some things up. And they got into it, and all I did was, hey, I'm not siding. Look, you did a great job. Y'all get together. You can work it out, whatever. And one of them got mad and left the church. She didn't say nothing about the plates. It's, man, that preacher, him and his friends and his buddies, and he's got his entourage, and that's the only people he hangs around and loves and all. I mean, I just went to the dogs, Miss Brita. And they come to me and ask me to kind of get involved and work it out. Seriously? That's no respect there, folks. You don't like your pastor? Go out, tell him you love him, pray for him, and go on just like he ought to do with you. Not talk about people, not tell the plate story on you. <laughs> <laughs> the grace of Christ. Let me tell you something. The grace of Christ was exhibited as a mere child. The Bible says in Luke chapter number 2, when Jesus was growing up, that he waxed strong in the spirit, that he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. You know, when I read that verse, that's very, that is a childlike verse that everybody can understand. You know why the grace of God was on Jesus? Not just because he was son. Where, where was Jesus often found? Was he down at the playground? Was he at the skating rink? Was he, I mean, was he out playing video games or 
tweeting. Uh, where was he at? He was more times than not found where? In the temple. What was he doing? Praying. Teaching. He was teaching elders. He, the Bible says he had the grace of God because he was filled with the Spirit. How do you get filled with the Spirit? Read your Bible. Pray. Come to church. You want the Spirit of God on your life? Be faithful. You want the grace of God upon you? Come to church. Get involved. I like that little thing somebody shared with me the other day. So instead of going out here ragging your church and trying to find the perfect church and leaving the one that you're in, why don't you come and do something and get involved and help the church? Amen. I believe that's, that's the most true statement I've ever heard. Ever wonder why you're not experiencing grace in your life? Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you prayed longer than five minutes? Read more than a verse or two in your Bible. See, grace is unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. The more we do for God, the more grace I promise you, you'll receive. God honors service. He honors our prayer life. He honors our witness. I put out on the sign out there. Some of you saw it. Some of you didn't read it. When you go out, it's fine. God hears. God answers. Prayer works. That's the grace of God. That's God's grace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ was manifested in self-sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 8 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that, though, listen to this, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Hmm. That ye through his poverty might be rich. Man, I tell you one thing, boy. That was about the time Jack jumped up on my desk yesterday. Some of you saw that. He just standing there looking at me. I was like, yeah, that's, that's good, ain't it? That was the verse I was on. The Bible says he was rich, but he was willing to become poor so that you could become rich. What kind of grace is that? How many of you today would go out, walk out of here and take every money, piece of money you got in your pocket and into your bank account and go down to the homeless shelter and say, here guys, have it. Because I'm rich over there. Ain't many people do that. It's grace. Jesus did it for us. How often do we exhibit self-sacrifice? How many times do you worry? As a matter of fact, today, how many of you are worried about the people who are out of church today? I agonize over it. It gives me ulcers. How about the people that are out of church? Well, it's because they're tight. It ain't about their tights. No. It ain't about, it ain't about the numbers. It's about not seeing them and knowing. All it takes is to miss one Sunday and two Sunday, and they're back out the world. And it's hard to get people back once they get a taste of the world. How many of you are spending that dollar bill that you make to help other people? How many people is given? Money to missionaries. Listen, we, we, we got a few missionaries here at the church want to take on more. How many times have you ever thought, you know, Brother Mark Martinez over there, you know, he's done a tremendous work. And man, look at all the Philippine kids over there in that church. I mean, they are just growing by leaps and bounds there. How many people have ever thought, you know what? I'm not going to wait out this week. I'm going to write a check. I'm going to take it and say, hey, send this to Brother Mark. I'm not telling you you have to do that. I'm saying, where is our hearts at, folks? I promise you, you give up something here on earth, one day you're going to be rewarded for it. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is sufficient for all needs. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in what? In weakness. He says, most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Folks, I'll tell you something today. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is all you'll ever need. It fills voids and longings. It'll give you power when you're at your weakest. It'll give you, um, it'll, it'll put a smile on your face. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. He said, because you're with me. Think about that. If I'm laying on my hospital bed and the doctor's told me i got three months to live, can I smile? I say, boy, God's grace sure has been good. Or do you say, God, how can you do this to me? You're only going to give me three more months. Maybe you've been living 70 years. Three months, Lord, how is that fair? What about the other 69 and a half years of your life that God's allowed you to live? Is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? God's grace. It is bestowed on sinful men. In 1 Timothy 1, verse number 12, the Bible says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, put me into ministry. Listen, for everybody here that God has put into a ministry and allowed to serve in a capacity, 
of a pastor, a teacher, a singer, a musician, whatever God has allowed you to do, you ought to be thankful for the blood of Christ that has enabled a sinner like ourselves to be counted faithful. What a powerful statement. I thank God that he counted me faithful because he didn't have to. And this is my last point. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is a, sort of, uh, is a source of power. And I tell you, it's not the intellect or the muscles that you have. Back in the day when I used to lift weights real heavy and I weighed about 25 more pounds, and I mean, I could show you pictures, man, and I, some people who knew me, that's all I cared about. When I was lost, Brother Caleb, I mean, I lifted every day, and boy, I, I had, had my tattoos and this, that, and the other, and man, I just thought I was something. You know what? When God cuts you down to size, you realize you're nothing. Yeah. It's not your looks. It's not your job. When I was a police officer, boy, I thought, man, I got the power and all that. And boy, you just think you got the tiger by the tail. But boy, then you look at the, the realm of God and, and, and all of a sudden you realize that you ain't even a speck in His universe. 2 Timothy 2.1 Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul told Timothy, he said, Hey, the power is in the grace of the Lord. It's not in you. Listen, the power is not in Tim Jones. My preaching, it doesn't come from down here. It comes from up there. It's nothing that I can do. Plug into him today. His grace is sufficient, the Bible says, for your finances, your family problems, your spiritual problems, uh, the problems of the flesh. He's all you need. Paul told Timothy, he said, that's all you need. I want everybody to do this for me. It's 20 after. Just real, real quick. If you got a Bible, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 22. Everybody, if you got a Bible in front of you, just turn here. I want you to say something real fast. I've got it written down, but I want you to look at this. Revelation chapter number 22. The last verse in the Word of God in the last book of the New Testament says this. And it should say it in yours. Verse number 21. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The grace. You don't think there's something sweet and special about grace? He ends off everything from, hey, Alpha and Omega to the beginning to the end, the first, the last, the very last thing he says. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to finish it off. This is it. We're going out with a bang. Hey, uh, John was done. He's done, he's done written. He's done, uh, wrote down everything that God showed him and everything. And he ends it off and he says, you know what? Out of everything that I've said, here's what I want you to remember. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You know what he was saying? God's grace. Jesus' grace, the sufficient grace, the unmerited grace, the free grace, the power that, that, that rest in grace. He says, be with you all. Now, boy, you don't think that can't get you through this life? It can't get you through when people want to cuss you out and threaten you because you prayed for somebody? It can't get you through trials and tribulations in your life? Oh, it can. You know why? Because it's good. And it's perfect. And it's power. And it's goodness grace. For everybody sitting here today, I want you to stand. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Can you come on up if you will, sir? If somebody don't mind if somebody would hit that thing on that Facebook thing still going. We don't like to record the invitation, so if it's on there, you just hit stop for me, please. Every head bowed, every eye closed today.